She spent 31 years teaching in the public school system, the last 23 in Boone County. After retiring in 1989, she became involved with the Didsmore Homestead Foundation and still serves as a volunteer. Her volunteer work includes chairing the cookbook committee for the Kentucky and Boone County Bicentennials, the Boone County Library, Boone County Garden Club, and teaching music. With much pleasure and thanks, we introduce our speaker. There she is. <laughs> How's that? of quilting. So that's basically what I'm going to talk about is the history of quilting from, is it Genesis to Revelation? No. <laughs> <laughs> Way back when, until uh, 1940, because, uh, well, you'll understand. Now, what makes a quilt antique? The same thing that makes me a senior citizen, <laughs> length of years. To label a car an antique, it must be 50 years old or older. For a quilt, it's 70 years, and for furniture, it's 100. So I'm somewhere between a quilt and a piece of furniture. <laughs> <laughs> Quilting is a familiar process known to all of us through things we use today, such as um, clothing, paper products. My best definition for a quilt is a cloth sandwich, top, bottom, and something in between. And the something in between is called batting. Now there is evidence that the quilting process has been used as far back as 3,000 years before Christ. It's been found in drawings, writings, and remnants. We know Egyptian monarchs used quilted clothing, and it was widely used in medieval Europe as part of a soldier's protective armor. Because of a change in the ocean currents, which brought bitter cold to England and Europe in the 17th and 18th century. Hmm, they had a weather problem too, didn't they? <laughs> I guess instead of warming, it was cooling. <laughs> they used quilted drapes, bed hangings, and covers for protection against the cold weather. As people migrated or immigrated to the New World, they brought family, tools, animals, and high hopes for a better life. They also came with knowledge, customs, and concepts. And quilting was one of the skills that they could practice in this country by most members of the family. The clothing and bedding they needed was what had been brought, and of course space was limited, or what they could make at home, which was a very time-consuming process. At that time, most of their time was spent on survival skills. Now they could purchase cloth and other items that were brought from England, but the cost was prohibitive. So frugality was a necessity and every scrap of cloth was precious. I didn't include this in here, but we've all heard of the right man. We've read about the right man. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and later in another period here and in England, that was a very common person on the streets buying and selling rags. I know some of what you women are thinking, I like to clean out my closet. <laughs> At that time, one third of English exports were woolen cloth and the colonists were forbidden to, to produce cloth as an industry. The English law stated that no sheep, flaxseed, tools, or people who knew how to use them were permitted to go to the New World. To disobey meant jail, loss of hand, or loss of life. Now, from this point on, we're going to look at how quilting evolved in America. 
and it's it's easy to use the important historic periods in our history as a timeline so that's how I'm going to do this and I'm going to begin with the first of six periods and this is the colonial era 16 to 1700 at that time quilts were made in their simplest form a whole cloth quilt a whole cloth quilt is simply a piece or pieces of cloth for a top and a bottom and anything available for batting it could be worn blankets drapes linens parts of clothing quilted petticoats were common back then <coughs> and by the way there's a quilt back on the back table that I'm almost sure there's a quilt inside the quilt because they use whatever they had and the quilt would be tied or tacked together with pieces of string or yarn there was no time for quilting Lindsay Woolsey was a fabric that could be made at home and would have been a likely choice for a top and maybe muslin on the back Lindsay Woolsey was a fabric made of wool with a cotton or linen warp. Now, any cotton grown here in America as a commercial crop would have to be shipped to England and then brought back to the colonies as finished cloth. The selvage on the edge of that cloth had three little blue lines woven into it indicating that it was made only for export and therefore it was taxed. England's Navigational Act stated only English ships can transport goods to America and only goods that England needs can be brought back <coughs> on those ships. So what the fabrics the first settlers brought soon wore out and they couldn't afford more. And since England was so far away, the Massachusetts Bay Colony in 1640 passed these orders. First, a bounty or bonus for anyone who could process flax. Classes were set up to teach young people how to make cloth. Uh, common grazing lands were set aside. And they even paid a town shepherd out of public money. No export of sheep and no slaughter of sheep under two years old. The second era that we're going to talk about is the 17th and 18th century, and this was considered the Revolutionary War era. And it brought greater awareness of the unfair treatment of the colonies by England. Since a machine that produced cloth was a forbidden export, one colonist went back to England, memorized a complete machine, came back to America, and built it. So the first cotton textile mill was built in Pawtucket, Rhode Island in 1790. During this period, quilts, again, were still basically whole cloth quilts. Uh, and again, they would be made with whatever fabric you had, or whatever size it was, or whatever bed you were going to put it on because there were no standard sizes. And besides, most settlers used woven blankets or woven coverlets. A fabric war developed among the English, the French, and, the, and India. And England could not compete with the beautiful figured and colored fabrics coming out of India, which both the English and the French preferred. These same fabrics were also being brought to America. Sir Walter Raleigh persuaded King James I, yep, that's the same king that translated the Bible, to let the English mills use the same block printing methods that they used in England, India and France. Now, since this only worked on plant matter, like cotton and linen, they became the favored fabrics. Later, King George III lifted all restrictions on printing cotton cloth in 1737, and soon cotton became king. Now, cotton is considered the most important and versatile fiber in the world. Scientists have found pieces of cotton and, and cotton bowls in Mexican caves that date back 8,000 years. Cotton was the leading crash crop in the United States, cash crop in the United States in 206. And in fact, it has been the major crop in this country since 1793. When the cotton gin was invented by Eli Whitney, it changed everything. 
Before that time, it took a whole year for a slave to pick the seeds out of one bale of cotton. Whole cloth quilts were still the most common found, but they livened them up by cutting large floral prints from these wonderful French fabrics that they could get. And you could only afford one piece. And applique them in the middle of their quilts and created a medallion quilt. This process was called board repairs or Persian embroidery. And that term is used only to refer to quilts made at that period. Um, Political and memorial quilts began to appear, especially after 1817 and 82, when the bald eagle was adopted as the national emblem. Quilts were one way a woman or a slave could express a political opinion because they couldn't vote and they couldn't speak in public. Peace block quilts, four patch, nine patch, began to appear, along with stars, sunbursts, and mosaics. Stripy or strippy quilts made of alternate strips of fabric were common. And other choices were cheater cloth, a fabric which has the pattern printed on it, so you don't have to do anything but quilt it. Handmade cotton and wool batting was used. Printed fabric was made available in America by 1848. India produced a multi-pattern and multicolored cotton cloth called chintz, which is a cousin to Cretan. Wood block and copper engraving plates were the two main methods of printing uh, pictures or anything on fabric. But Thomas Bell modified that by making it a cylinder roller, like the old-fashioned uh, washing machine rollers, ringers. And so that speeded up the process considerably. Now, dyes at this time were still, for fabric, were still plant-based. Uh, they used onion skin, bark of the butternut tree, unripe black walnut hulls, goldenrod, indigo, and madder. Incidentally, James Dinsmore grew madder down on his Boone County farm. Madder is actually an herb, and it's real woody, and they use the root from it to produce a lot of different colors. Uh, depending on what more that you use, and I'll explain that in a minute, it could produce turkey red, purple, pink, orange, and several shades of brown. Indigo is one of the oldest and best known dyes used as early as 2,500 years before Christ. Indigo, which is shades of blue, was both imported and grown here. Yellow and indigo would be combined to make green. However, no combination could ever be found to match the black that came from Egypt. Cloth could be made color fast, though, with the addition of a mordant. This served as a catalyst, and salt and iron were the two most common. That's why women would boil their cloth in an iron pot. And women who lived on the coast would rinse their fabric out in the salt water. Now, quilting patterns were generally grids or squares of diamonds or straight lines. You would see some leaf, feathers, or clamshell, uh, and these were often done in double or triple lines. And they began to use outline and echo quilting in some of these early quilts. Now we're going into the third period, which was the pioneer era, 1790 to 1850. This period in our history was marked by the War of 1812 and the settlement of the West. America was producing an abundance of cloth, so quilts began to serve purposes that transcended their practical use. A quilt could tell a story, document an event, give pleasure for the lonely, and provide an artistic outlet. 